So uh, in this presentation, we will be talking about some principles of governance. Uh, and we have uh, proposed a three-way governance model, which is based on our past experience of uh, how we can manage and govern successful DHIS to implementations in countries. And we follow a, a proposed structure, which a country can implement uh, who are managing their implementations. And then we'll have a look at one of the examples of systems evaluation, which is the, the DHIS to maturity assessment uh, toolkit, which has recently been used in many countries to assess their existing DHIS to implementations. So we have the presentation, plus we'll have two Menti activities. So uh, please keep your devices ready so that you can log in into the Menti questionnaire and answer those questions, and we'll take those responses as we move ahead. So we'll be covering uh, the proposed three-layer governance mechanism for sustainable DHIS2 systems. Uh, just a, a cautionary note that this is not something that we're saying has to be there when you are managing your DHIS2 implementation. This is a proposed model which has been developed based on the past experiences that we've had working with the ministries of health and what could be a potential model of governance which could be administered in a country. Uh, with different people working in different levels with different skill sets, they can be arranged so that you have a national core team of DHIS2, uh, which is guided by a, a central committee, which comprises of uh, higher ministries, etc. Uh, we look at the three groups that we propose that should be formed in order to kind of have lay the foundation for a sustainable DHIS2 information system, the governance committee the DHS to operations management team and the DHS to core technical team. And we'll see what are the proposed skill set and the quantity of resources and their key responsibilities that we're talking about. So the learning objectives are, we would like to understand why clear governance and coordination mechanisms are important to sustain the implementations as a long-term uh, investment. And what are the three levels or, or the governance structure that we're trying to propose and what are the competencies which are required at each level so that when we go back, we can take this as a guiding tool and start implementing these interventions that we're proposing. Or if you already have these structures in place, then how can we better refine those responsibilities so that we have something which can work as a well-oiled machine as we go ahead. So uh, I'll share the code and the, the QR code for the Mentimeter. Uh, we have one very basic question for you to answer before we go ahead. So you can log into menti.com and enter the code 5641746. Or you can scan the QR code. Have around 17 logins, 19. Okay, so I'll just show the question. The code is 5641746. Okay. So we just have a very basic questions for you. Governance, what does this word mean to you in the context of information systems? So it's a free text question. Please feel, try to put few keywords which you think define governance when it comes to information systems. So as you put your answers, we'll quickly review them before we go ahead uh, with uh, further in the presentation. So 
Okay, so we have some responses. Uh, sustainability, yes, decision making, uh, regulations, commitment to lead and manage the vision, agreed upon understanding of management, laws and policies, yes, set of policies, decision making, data management. Multi-sectoral coordination, yeah, very much. Organizational management, framework, policy, and structure. <coughs> management body to support DHS to implementations. Spending sustainabilities. Policy management. Yeah, so we have a variety of keywords that our understanding is more or less aligned to what we wanted to propose as what is governance. So thank you for your responses. So I'll just move ahead. So uh, we'd like to discuss about some uh, why proper governance is crucial to uh, sustainable DHS2 systems. Um, we're looking at clear governance and coordination mechanisms because they're critical inputs to enable that DHS2 works as an integrated health information system in our countries. Now we're working in a multi-sectoral environment in the country where we have different health programs running. We have uh, HIV, TB, malaria, IDSR, RM, and CH. So it's a combination of programs and health services which a country is providing to its citizens. And it's and all of them bring their own complexity and their own priorities uh, when it comes to designing information systems. So we need to have a platform where all these uh, conflicting priorities could be brought up, could be discussed, and decisions could be made on those priorities. And that means that you have multiple stakeholders across the Ministry of Health and the national health programs, which need to have one joint operating body which can discuss these priorities and help in making decisions based on the priorities which are of more importance than the others. Okay, Because everything is important when it comes to health, but still things need to be prioritized and have to be given a defined order so that we don't miss upon certain opportunities which could be taken for a certain disease health program. And then we need an operational system that supports the need of different levels in the health systems. Now we're working at different levels in the health hierarchy. We're working in the community. We're going up to the district level. We're going up to the state level and moving up to the country level. At each level, we monitor different indicators. So the complexity increases when we go up the hierarchy. Therefore, we have to take note of all the nuances which happen at each level. Therefore. This governance should take care of the decisions or the indicators or the data that comes from each level and how that data is contributing to larger indicators, the coverage indicators, the performance indicators of the country. Therefore, governance is clearly very important when it comes to the essential design of your information system and how it can be put into a better shape so that it produces the outputs which it, which it is meant to produce. So what we propose is a three-layered governance model, which is a recommendation, which kind of should uh, uh, have three basic functions, where we should have a well-coordinated uh, prioritization process, which is led by, uh, say, the top level, which is your governance committee, which is a multi-sectoral uh, group of people who can discuss the priorities of different health programs and can come to decisions to decide what would be the strategy, what would be the timeline of certain health, health information systems implementation and kind of build a larger roadmap or, or DHIS strategy in country. Similar to what's happening in Sri Lanka and other countries where they're developing their digital health blueprints that is being led by a governance committee who is looking at the priorities of different sectors and how these health programs can work together and these the information systems can be built which can take care of multiple programs uh, at once. Then at the very high level, we are having a lot of decision making happening, but we need a team who can operationalize those decisions. Therefore, we recommend having a strong operation management team, which can guide the minor details of the work to the people who will actually do your, the technical implementation. And then we have a dedicated technical team who will actually carry out your DHS to configuration, implementation and capacity building. So it's a three-layered structure that we're trying to recommend based on the past experience that we've had 
that we should have a governance committee which should have stakeholders for multiple uh, ministries, multiple programs, health programs, which should make the overall blueprint of the HI student country, which is followed by the operations management team who is basically trying to find approaches to convert those decisions into actionable items. And then we have the technical team, which will basically carry out the DHS2 configuration and your capacity building implementation plus technical support towards managing what has been built in country for implementation. So let's look at the, the essential criteria which needs to be followed for a governance committee that we it should have a cross ministry committee where the key health information stakeholders across the ministries can are part of that specific committee so that their inputs are taken when you're deciding the overall strategy for health information system design. And they need to take all the strategic decisions when it comes to defining the scope of DHIS2. Okay. So when we start working with these countries, we initially try to identify a group of people who will be the key information stakeholders, which will define that what will be the essential scope of DHIS2 when we start it in the country and essentially how the scale up will be planned. So this group should have members from all the important ministries, all the important health programs so that we have opinions coming in from everyone and we can define a joint work plan for execution. And we also recommend having representatives from all the major health programs in country. We recommend that the governance committee should have both tech, the members should have both technical and public health leadership. So we should have members who have rich experience of working in public health interventions. Plus they also have experience in implementing technology solutions so that they can uh, combine both the aspects of health and technology together so that these areas are not left untouched because ultimately both these areas are important for any successful HIS implementation. And then we need a clear mandate and a continuous meeting cycle so that continuous directions are given to the operations management team. So it's not a one-off meeting that you met once you designed your work plan and you forget about it. You need to keep on meeting on a frequent basis so that the updates that have happened so far can be analyzed critically and corrective actions could be made and the operations management team could be given further directions on how to deal with certain situations or how to plan ahead, which they can further take up with the technical team in country to actually implement the, the uh, decisions that they take. Then we have the DHS to operational management team who are basically responsible for implementing the priorities and plans which are set out by the governing committee. So the key decisions have been taken. Now it's time to define approaches to bringing those decisions into actual actionable items. So we recommend having a DHS to lead or a DHS to manager who can work with the security manager in place where they can uh, be responsible for the overall ownership of the DHS2 system and be responsible for managing the long-term sustainability of the system. So the DHS2 operational lead is a sort of full-time position that we recommend that should be part of the country's operational team, while the security manager can be a larger, with a person with a larger umbrella of health, health plus other systems and in country because security is an overarching field which has impact on health and other technical uh, information systems as well for other areas also. So he could play a supportive role for health information systems as well. But DHS to operationally should be a full-time responsibility where he can put his 100% effort on materializing the decisions which have been taken by the governance committee. So the operational lead should work closely with the technical team so that he can provide, he or she can provide clear guidance and plans are in place so that the actionable items are well executed and are tested well and then are implemented as we go ahead as per the project activities and the project plans. Next, we come to the DHS to core technical team. These people will be responsible for day-to-day -day technical activities and for maintenance of the system. Uh, therefore, we need to clearly define some standard operating procedures for the technical team in terms of what operations they need to take on their health information systems and how they plan to execute the activities which are defined by the DHS to operations team. So we recommend uh, an optimal size of around four to six people, which will comprise of your configuration and maintenance aspects, server administration, data security, 
and the people can play a dual role of configuration maintenance plus they can also carry out capacity building activities as and when needed and generally we recommend following a train the trainer method so where you could do you can create master users within the within your uh, ministry and the, the public health workforce working in districts and they can further train do cascade trainings in country to provide further uh, capacity building to the other members working at the health facility so the server administration and data security are overarching positions so they could be working for other uh, departments at the ministries as well on their information systems. So we can have share these resources uh, for health information systems as well. When it comes to building DHIS2 capacities, of course, these uh, there's no specific educational qualifications required to be a DHIS2 uh, expert, but uh, generic understanding of IT databases and information systems is required. and um, these DHIS2 skills can be improved, can be taken in from the academies, from the online academies, the courses which are already available free of cost for all the users. Plus they can also attend the DHIS2 academies organized in different regions and countries on different thematic areas at regular intervals. So that are the source of building further capacities in your, on your DHIS2 uh, skill set. If the person has some public health knowledge, that is definitely useful because ultimately we're looking at public health audience and public health data collection. So some knowledge in public health would be helpful for him to understand the entire landscape of why the information system is being built, what is the importance of data that is being collected and how is that data being used uh, when the forms and everything are defined in within the information system. Uh, Ideally, we recommend that the team should be part of the ministry so that they have an ownership of the work that they're doing. But in certain circumstances, the ministry cannot hire such a big team. So the team could be external, but the sustainability is a quest is a recommendation that they should have long term contracts so that they do not leave after short term assignments. And it's difficult to track people. And if you run into uh, certain issues, then Many times we've seen that ministries struggle to provide long-term contracts to consultants or the team members. So the idea is when you are generate, you're designing your annual work plans, you're putting your country funding cycles to, uh, to request to Global Fund, Gavi and other donor agencies, make sure you plan your DHIS to teams in advance and you put in enough money for supporting long-term DHIS to teams in country, which work as part of the Ministry of Health and then they can be further supported by the his groups working in your region in training and building capacities of the internal and the team at Ministry of Health so that we build a sustainable relationship between his, the Ministry of Health and the health information systems that we're trying to build. So the summary of the proposed governance model is, is given here where we, uh, we recommend that we, if this, uh, model is adopted or recommendations are taken in our existing structure what has been discussed here would help you in terms of building this coordination as a long-term process and you'll see gradual improvements happening over the course of your HIS implementation uh, the ministries where these positions are not yet defined uh, if these positions are then they will need to be defined uh, as new positions uh, and there will be some uh, um, uh, specific problems when it comes to recruitment, finding the right persons. But overall, this if this approach is followed, then you will be able to implement a long-term capacity building plan. And because you need to identify people, and if you identified people, then the next work is to make sure that their capacities are built in association with his groups and the DHS to academies. And then these people can be sustained over time to ensure that they're able to perform their job well within the uh, health information system team. Um, so we need to ensure that we follow the main principles of coordination system management, and we will need to lay out some SOPs in place so that we have clear definitions of what role each person, each position has to perform, and what are the expectations from that person, and if we can define some uh, uh, eligibility criteria, then that would be helpful in making the selections. And we have, in the previous slides, we have some guidances which are available, which are industry standards like COVID, TOGAF, these are enterprise architecture standards, which are not specifically for health systems, but they can be applied to health systems as well. 
plus the uio team is frequently updating documents and releasing guidance documents as we learn more from the community and from the country implementations they continue to release documentation on guidances of how you can sustain the health information systems over a longer period with the proposed strategies that could be implemented and be shared with the teams that you put into place So before I uh, go ahead with the systems evaluation piece, uh, giving one example of DHS to maturity profile, if there are any questions that the participants would like to ask, then we could discuss before we go ahead. Hello. <clears throat> so thank you for the presentation. It's very really comprehensive guidance to how can establish the the DSS in the country. So my question is that uh, yes, if you, if you are talking about the uh, the central Ministry of Health, how to operate it, how to implement DSS, we gone through this three layer of the uh, uh, coordination mechanism. But when we come down into the uh, program reference, meaning that uh, uh, like HIV, TB, or surveillance, or mother, mother and child, do we, do we still need to have uh, this three layer applied for them? For example, TB need, need also, the, or malaria need also have the uh, uh, governance committee, or they also, they also need operational uh, management, or they also need Go uh, uh, technical team I, or not? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chansi. So we're not recommending having a repetitive structure within each health program because that will be difficult to coordinate plus manage in terms of financial resources available. So we're looking at an overarching team which can be which can take considerations, requirements, priorities from each national health program separately. And given the uh, the list of priorities that national health programs bring, then the governance committee can decide that which program priorities have to be taken first when they design overall timeline and work plan for HIS scale up in country. So we definitely do not recommend that you should have a separate uh, structure for each of the health programs, but we recommend having uh, more of a overarching structure which can be part of which can take care of needs of all the health programs which are running in the country that's why when we recommended the governance committee we mentioned that it should include all the relevant ministries plus all the major health programs should be part of the governing committee so that they can understand the needs of each health program and make conscious decisions and then the team in, involved can uh, implement that work plan based on the priorities that were set by the governance committee i hope that answers your question Any more questions? Yes. Okay, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Maybe I will sharing in the KI Jakarta implementation to, to success the use of the HIS2 to manage our data. We create obligations such as like a policy to force everyone in the district health office, provincial health office, or government health facility to enter the data, to use the data, to use the HIS2 platform to manage the data. Uh, but, and then uh, furthermore, uh, we create performance indicators of the use the HIS2, uh, the HIS2 to use the data in the dashboard, to analyze the data and also to enter the data and to, to make the integrations between health facility to us, to district health office and provincial health office. If, but if uh, we create penalties, such as like the penalty, if you don't want to enter the data, if you uh, report the data uh, late, et cetera, I will cut off your salary. I will cut off your salary every month. And I think the regulation, the policy, it works. So the, the use of the, uh, the HIS2 in these years 
is very uh, success in DKI Jakarta. So I think we need not uh, to uh, strengthen of the facility, human research, and etc. So we need the policy, we need regulations, obligations to force based on my country regulation. I think uh, you can adapt uh, in your country. Thank you. Thank you, Intan. So yeah, definitely you make a very good point that regulations are equally important. So yes. like we we yes. mentioned about more on the having a layered governance structure and the yeah. operational and the technical people. But yes, at the end of the day, you need to have standard operating procedures at each level, which determine your cutoff dates for data entry, your data quality checks, your data locking periods. So that SOPs, which can be decided by the governance committee that these are the deadlines that you want to set for reporting, which are then implemented by the operations and technical team. So this way, I think it's a good example of these decisions were already taken at a very high level and then now it comes the time that they're implemented and these are giving you results in terms of better reporting rates and uh, timeliness rates. So that's definitely a good example of how these decisions were taken. And these decisions are now converted into actionable items which include your reporting protocols that you set. So thank you for sharing your observations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sohab, for, for uh, your presentation. I want just to make sure that uh, I have understood what you uh, have uh, presented. Uh, and the country level, we need first uh, like a steering committee or, or um, a high level committee, which is uh, multi-sectorial, uh, uh, dealing with all the aspects of DHIS2 in the country. Yes. Underneath it should be a technical committee, which will be speci specialized in all aspects of DHIS2. And uh, in all of these, we need to have uh, SOBs. So that will organize the work, okay? So uh, up to this moment, I am going right. So yes. my question, is this the case in all the countries? No, sir. So the, this was not the case in the countries. That's why we came up with this approach that why information systems are not running on a longer sustainable basis because of lack of these committees in place. So the experience that we have had over the years in terms of managing these country implementations, we, have, we based on those learnings, we have kind of, we are defining or recommending that this structure, if it can be implemented by a Ministry of Health, then gradually they'll see those improvements happening in the processes, in the design of the system and the implementation. So, uh, and the whole concept of suggesting this came from the failures and the challenges that we saw in these countries that um, that were facing issues with DHS to implementations. So not all the countries are doing it. That's why we are recommending that the, the, those who have such similar structures in place can strengthen them more by following these guidelines. And those who do not have these set structures can go back and start working on setting up these structures in country to support their DHIS to implementations. And the evaluation it comes from the committee, the high committee, yes? Yeah, so we'll talk about evaluation. So the decision okay. to carry out these evaluations, uh, understanding the results of the evaluation and then making decisions to correct the findings of the evaluation, those will come from the governance committee. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's clear right now that you have uh, brought a structure of uh, three levels. Uh, for the governor's uh, committee, I mean, this structure is not just limited to the DHIS2 system, uh, implemented systems but it probably will uh, affect other projects and other systems that uh, in, uh, are dealing with information. Uh, we, we also uh, need clarifications about how to involve other uh, committees, I'm sorry, other uh, parties, governmental parties who are involved in the uh, information sector uh, not just the health information sector, but in general, uh, in this committee, in the uh, governance committee, and uh, uh, to explain 
what kind of um, coordination that should be, uh, you know, in this area. Yeah, your understanding is very much correct. This is not limited to only DHIS2, but when talking about a more um, digital system strategy in country, it may include all in other information systems as well, including DHIS2. So this structure reform can help you to have a overall overarching uh, information system design uh, governance committee. So it may include other health systems also. Uh, coming to setting this up, of course, this needs uh, much more communication and uh, direction to be given, say, from the Ministry of Health to other ministries, say, Interior Affairs or Information Technology Ministry, to come together to build a platform where we can join forces, build expertise together, and create a common uh, committee where they could discuss all the areas which relate to data and information needs. But then I think we can also uh, utilize the the donors who are active in the region to build on this, help you building this coordination because uh, when it comes to financial support and when donors push for a more joint intersectoral plan or a joint coordination plan, the ministries tend to listen and they they kind of agree to uh, work together. When, they, when the donors also give a push that this needs to be a more integrated activity rather than just Ministry of Health or Ministry of IT defining things uh, what should be the digital health blueprint in a country. So I think there are many ways where you could also enforce internal communication, but if you need support from the donors, then we can, of course, they can be reached out and the communication channel, the challenges could be discussed and they could be one of the instrumenting factors who can help you in bringing people on board and uh, kind of working towards a, a more integrated approach. So in the assessment piece that we'll cover, we'll see why we designed the maturity assessment toolkit uh, to kind of uh, show the donors a joint, a combined picture of the HIS assessment in country so that many donors could come together and then they could also influence the ministries and their focal points to come together to build a stronger steering committee or a governance committee in a country. So, Sir, I would like to yeah. add some uh, something from the Nepal. Uh, we are in Nepal. We are um, implementing two things for the better uh, DHS2, uh, especially in reporting system. First one is for the government. Uh, the government health facility who are uh, reporting in our DHS system, and they are motivated by themselves. And we uh, use uh, when they are uh, rewarding the health facility, we take one indicator who fulfill the. Um, they are just two reporting in uh, on time. That is also one indicator for the motivation and the reward for that health facility uh, in local level, provincial level, and central level. And in the annual uh, review or biannual review, we gave, uh, we give uh, them reward for that uh, that completing uh, DHS two reporting in time. Similarly, for the private sector, uh, we have one uh, rules uh, for them. If they didn't uh, uh, did uh, the DHS two uh, reporting in the uh, in our platform, they would not uh, register or renew in our system. That's the clause. So uh, in the, we can uh, do better in uh, the information system. Otherwise private sector is uh, very hard to um, come in our system. Uh, they have own system and they don't want to uh, collaborate uh, uh, in our government system for the information. So that, that is the clue. When they uh, come for registration or the renewal, uh, they must submit uh, and the monthly report in the DHS2 platform. Uh, after that, only they get their uh, renewal of that uh, health facility. So that is also good uh, for uh, our uh, regular recording and reporting in sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I mean, Nepal has had a unique system where they have uh, governments at different levels who are able to manage their challenges and priorities internally as well. So they have these LGDs are working at the board and the municipality level, then they have districts and then they have provinces. So I think they've implemented a very good model where they have these committees at the smaller levels as well, so that all the initial issues can be taken care of by the municipality committee and then only the escalations that happen when you need help from the provincial or district health offices to intervene and provide solutions. So that's a very good example of uh, a bottom to top approach for decision making and management. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, so I think we have around 16 minutes, so I'll quickly review the maturity profile. 
So DHIS to maturity profile uh, uh, toolkit is basically uh, uh, assessment framework, which was developed uh, along with the coordination with the global fund team and the team at the University of Oslo to try and assess the maturity of a DHIS to implementation over certain important factors, uh, which we'll see in detail and comprising of your aggregate implementations, your tracker implementations and targeting key disease programs, HIV, TB, malaria, immunization, surveillance, and any other program if you wanted to assess the maturity of, in terms of system use, data use, availability of HR, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll quickly see how this uh, assessment was carried out in few countries and what were the outcomes that we saw and how it can be used by other countries as well to assess the majority of their implementations. So I'm sorry if the font is a little small, but then uh, there's no fixed recipe to have a mature DHS to implementation. But then when we talk about information systems, there are three pillars that are essentially required. One is people, the other is process, and third is technology. People we already identified in the first presentation that we need to have this layered model and each uh, layer has a specific set of people to work with. They should have defined roles and responsibility. So I'll not go into more details. Uh, process we already defined that as mentioned by the members from Indonesia and Nepal that they have good processes to measure the data quality. They have good processes to ensure data use and they have uh, SOPs and routine reviews being carried out. So that takes care of the process and technology is of course the infrastructure and the infrastructure needs a lot of, all three of these need a lot of investment but then infrastructure also needs investment so that when your DHS to implementation scale up, they are backed by a strong infrastructure so that you don't have technology challenges uh, in, in, in scaling up your DHS to solutions. And even the technology needs to be continuously assessed so that any gaps identified can be fulfilled moving forward through financial support from donors to, uh, to other mechanisms available as well. So the whole purpose behind designing the DHS to maturity profile was to have a mechanism to measure the progress of the health system strengthening over time. So this is not designed to be a one-time process. It is designed to be a continuous process that every year or every, every year you carry out assessment and then you see the change of what was the situation a year before and with the inputs that have gone in both uh, technical uh, uh, and uh, financial inputs that have gone in, what has been the improvement over time. Uh, it tries to identify the areas which need more strengthening so that your investments or your requests to donors are going in the right direction. And the donors can also see that these are the key areas where the country is not performing so well and is not at the adequate level as it should be. So the funds have a clear direction that the fund should go to that specific activity. So we'll see how these scorings are done, how we come up with the conclusion of uh, the uh, maturity profile. And then once you have this picture, they kind of tell you very clearly in what areas, which health programs, uh, which foundational activities, the country is performing well and where it is not performing well. So that the donors can see and identify that what are the areas that they can support. Uh, it's a good reflection of your country's existing situation and giving the donors uh, a good view of what's happening right now and what are the areas that you want financial support to strengthen more. So they also have clear information available to decide the direction of their investments. So if you see the difference between the two images that are shown here, which are based on fictional data. So you have country one and country two. You'll see for country one, they have performed well when it comes to core team for DHS2 maintenance. They have good quality metadata for DHS2. They uh, have good level of trainings for end users. They have data collection set up uh, for facility and population profile and their infrastructure needs are well taken care of. So their foundational activities are more or less acceptable. So they're doing well in terms of uh, pacing their information system scale up. But when you compare with country two, you'll see a lot of foundational areas are in early progress. They haven't reached the uh, adequate or mature level. So therefore you see that country two needs more investment in terms of firming up their foundation areas because if the foundation is weak, 
and it applies to uh, all these things that we build. If it's a house or something, you need to have a strong foundation. So we uh, house is equivalent to uh, building your information system in country. If it has a weak foundation, then there are many chances that you face challenges of scale up, challenges of implementation, challenges with uh, user capacity. Therefore, when these assessment questions are answered, it grades your responses and gives you a final outcome that these are the areas which are at this level at present so that you can highlight that these are the activities, these are the programs which need more support. And you can make a strong case to the donors that these are the areas where we need more help so that they can direct the funds accordingly. Okay. So in through this uh, tool, you can assess the maturity of your DHIS to implementation in country. It measures and helps you understand how is the country progressing on the health immune system strengthening. And it kind of summarizes beyond the activities. So of course, when you design a health system, you the basic activities will definitely will put into place because you're defined processes for that. But then overall, how the system is performing uh, in terms of the level of maturity that it can come that can be measured through this respective assessment as it gives a good reflection of the uh, the legends, the criteria that has been set up, both in terms of their maturity level and their implementation scale also. So we're looking at uh, that the particular intervention for DHIS2, either aggregate or tracker, can be in development, could be in a, at a pilot stage, or has been scaled up to a country level. So that also is assessed when the, the questions are being evaluated and answered for the toolkit. So the whole idea behind building this toolkit was to get a clear cut picture of where your DHIS2 uh, implementation stands in terms of maturity, so that the investments could be uh, uh, sent through in the right direction where they are required. Special focus was given to the foundational areas because they were the ones in the countries that we assessed. We found that the foundational areas were either early progress or they were not yet achieved. And mostly we found that the countries lack, uh, uh, they have early progress on either leadership or governance or strategy and investment. They had no clear work plans, uh, no joint work plans being made. And we saw that a lot of countries were struggling with their core team for DHS to maintenance with their capacities. So when Global Fund used these um, profiles for deciding what areas they like to fund, they made sure the funds go to foundation areas first. So they help countries to build, uh, provide its uh, financial support to the his groups to create, to do more capacity building activities for the selected countries to ensure that they have a core team with strong DHS to skills. They invested in upgrading the DHS to versions so that the people can use the latest DHS to features. And they also helped in assessment of metadata to kind of improve the quality of metadata, which also affects the, the data in the system. So the whole idea is that through this tool, you can align your investments and your total interventions very clearly because you have a clear picture and it will help you in assisting your DHS to implementation and sending activities if you carry out this assessment on a regular interval. Before any fund cycle you're doing for any donor, if you can do a reflection of the status, then it helps you to identify your bottlenecks and you can direct your funding request based on resolving those specific bottlenecks which have identified. So I think this I've already covered. Yeah. So the tools that, uh, uh, the tool captures three core areas of DHS to implementation, the tracker, aggregate, and foundational. Foundational is at the bottom because it's a, it's the more Im most important aspects which need to be taken care into account. So we are looking at legislation, governance, security, infrastructure as the, and the capacity as the foundational areas. We are looking at the aggregate data collection by different health programs and then you move up to tracker and we're moving up in the way the complexity increases. So you need to have foundations clear. You need to have aggregate data collection but then tracker is more complicated. So it's at the top because you take a uh, uh, time to switch from your aggregate reporting to a case first reporting to mature over a period of time. Okay. So uh, the recommendations that we have for aggregate systems, when you're trying to enhance your DHS to aggregate programs, make sure that your foundation areas are at least early progress. Your people have basic skill sets available 
to enter data into DHIS2, use the basic data which they're entering, and you have early capacity within your uh, HMIS team to manage the daily incoming requests and understanding the whole information system, how it has been built and how it operates in the country. Okay? So if you have weak foundation areas and you're planning to further scale up your aggregate interventions, so that the recommendation is to focus more on the foundational aspects first and then plan the scale up when it comes to the aggregate, um, aggregate uh, the expansion. So if your foundation topics are not yet achieved, make a priority that these need to be achieved first before you enhance your data collection and you scale up your program horizontally and vertically in terms of both content and your scope of data collection. Tracker is always much complicated because you're dealing with individual records. So when you are uh, planning to start a tracker program, it, it is a complex endeavor because you're, you need a large investment in infrastructure if you you are you want uh, data to be captured at the point of care, you need to have laptops or desktops or mobile apps available. Mobiles available with the uh, service provider to collect data. Therefore, it needs a lot of planning uh, to to, uh, to estimate the infrastructure, the capacity, and uh, the skills which are required to use tracker in country. Therefore, you need to have first of all uh, the institution buy-in from the st key stakeholders, that would be a governance committee. So when your governance committee is convinced that you have enough resources to implement tracker in your country, then only move forward towards tracker implementation. Funding again is uh, very important because aggregate systems scale up much faster as compared to tracker systems. Therefore tracker systems will need much more funding support and tracker is requires much more capacity building, much more re refresher trainings for people to um, understand the complexities of case-based reporting because when they're reporting case-based data, data quality again is of key importance. So aggregate data quality is also important, but tracker data quality is much more important and take much more efforts to improve the case-based reporting. The capacity has to be there in terms of not only for people to use the system, but also the people to design the system and maintain the system over long term. So that should be taken into account. Here, since we're talking about patient records, we need to ensure that we only collect the vital information in your trackers, which contribute to indicators. Because if you design long forms, collect all sorts of information, which is not relevant to your key indicators, then you're increasing the workload for your health worker. So those decisions have to be taken into account before you are planning your tracker implementations. So in general, the foundational domains have to be at a minimum acceptable level when it comes to tracker. So if any of your foundational domain is at early progress, then we need to hold and make these foundational domains uh, go a level up and then proceed with your tracker implementations. And since we're dealing with patient data, so data security and privacy is a is key concern. Therefore, if you're implementing tracker implement, uh, if you're doing tracker programs and make sure your DHS security and compliance is at least at adequate level so that you have defined data sharing and data protection protocols so that these, the data is not misused because it has personal identifiable information as well. And whether your program wants to collect personal identifiable information or not, then that is also a decision you need to make before you implement your tracker programs in country. Then the last uh, recommendation is to focus on continuous improvements. So as with aggregate systems, uh, the planning and budgeting is very important uh, and is more complex when it comes to tracker because it needs more investments. So you need to continuously evaluate the performance of your tracker systems and make conscious decisions that where your funds need to go, which could be on infrastructure and capacity building. So we've seen a very good case in Nepal for the HIV tracker implementation that a, a, a big focus was only given to system design and implementation, but when they actually went to the facilities and asked the ART counselor that what value add you see in the system, they say, we don't see any value add. You, you have doubled our work. We are maintaining paper registers, we're maintaining uh, digital copies also. So then the whole funding went to data use activities where they showed them that how the system can help you identify patients who have missed their appointments and haven't come back for ART pill pickups. So when they saw that this system is solving a lot of their manual work, then the adoption increased many folds in country. 
So these decisions can only be taken when you do a very uh, uh, a continuous assessment of the implementations that you're doing so that you can define a good direction to your implementations as you move up. So thank you for your patience listening. I, it was a long session, uh, but I hope it was useful for uh, your in-country implementations. If there are any questions, we have around two minutes. We can take a couple of questions and then we can move on. Thank you, Swaramji, uh, for this great sharing of this very useful tool. So, uh, in uh, FHI, we are implementing this uh, FIACA almost in 18 countries from the FIACA program and also in aggregate. So, uh, um, it will be <laughs> helpful for us if we get this tool to assess our system. So, can we get this tool? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's free for. Uh... Mostly it's targeted for an overall assessment, but if you want to only focus on the HIV tracker, data collection, and the parameters on which we assess a tracker implementation, we can, of course, share the tools with you and make it an assessment focused on uh, the HIV program as well. Yes. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Uh, actually, uh, my very small question regarding the last point you mentioned uh, to take care of the tracker uh, uh, security uh, because when we start uh, when we offered uh, some uh, like TB program and other programs to use a tracker they uh, said no we are, we are not sure whether this data is secured or not so can you please elaborate more and about this point exactly? How can we uh, persuade them to uh, to use to use it or to give them at least uh, to assure them that the data is secured and no one can uh, can see it? Yeah, sure. Sir. So yeah, data security over the years has been a very critical uh, working area for us at DHIS too, and also at the Ministry of Hospitality, and they've invested a lot of resources and uh, expertise in terms of building guidance around security in DHIS too. So there are many ways in which you can maintain the security. One is of course at the system level, how you provide accesses to the stakeholders who have access to the system. So setting up clear sharing settings between users and users groups so that only the TB program personnel can have access to the TB data. And that too, if they only can access the aggregate that information, the dashboards and the indicators, and they don't have access to individual patient records, that levels have to be defined and shared with them that these are the mechanisms that we'll set up so that any other stakeholder who has access to the Libyan DHIS2 but has no access to TB, then he cannot access the TB data by any means. Then we have other mechanisms at the infrastructure level where you can set up uh, security protocols on, at your servers where to kind of prevent any sort of attacks on your uh, uh, on your infrastructure. So we will have a session. We have we'll be having Michael, uh, who is the security lead at the uh, University of Oslo Space Center, and he will be sharing uh, more information on uh, the measures of security and what improvements the DHIS2 team is bringing in terms of guidance. So we'll definitely you'll get more information on uh, managing the security risk within DHIS. One thing I want to supplement this one. For example, in uh, Bangladesh, there is a country regulation. If you want to implement any system, that should be passed the security audit. So there is a country security audit policy. So if you want to implement a DHS2 instance, so there will be security audit by our Ministry of uh, ICT. So they have one specific unit. They can test the system and certify this is the, there is no security hole or, or something. So that's the requirement. So our all DHS2 instances are security audited. Yeah, so I think a similar requirement is in India as well. So whenever you're doing a, any information system for a state government, it has to go a generic security audit uh, and that report has to be submitted to the government. Only then they allow the implementation and hosting of the uh, system at their data centers. So that's one of the protocols that are put into place by many countries. Any more questions? 
So since this was our last session, so we uh, are closing the sessions for the day. Uh, as directed by Dr. Pramod, we will be leaving for a social event at 6.30. So please be in the lobby by 6.30 a.m. for the transport to take you to the venue. And I hope you enjoyed the day and look forward to tomorrow. Thank you so much.